ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your panel on Blockchain Technology. What is it good for, really? Moderated by Executive Director of Global Market Development at the Milken Institute, Stacy Warden. Well, we saved the best for last here at the 2019 Milken Institute Global Conference, and I am so excited to do this blockchain panel with my illustrious guests. There is a lot of kind of confusion and misunderstanding and um, fast moving parts in the blockchain ecosystem. But in one hour, we are going to figure it all out for you. You're going to know where to put your money, what's hot, what's not, what's real, what's not real, um, and what's going on both from a kind of a business, a regulatory, and a public policy space. And we barely have enough time in one hour to get through all of this. So, Elad Gill, you are uh, you uh, run Electric Capital, and you're also a very sort of smart guy. And you're, uh, I don't know if you're skeptical. I wouldn't say you're skeptical necessarily, but you know you have views. I would say about where this is appropriate and where it's not. And so, can I? Could you start and just give for the audience a kind of an infrastructure for thinking about blockchain and where it's applicable? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so, at a high level, anytime there's a new technology wave there's an enormous amount of hype, and you often have to ask what's real and what's fake, and it's often driven by the under, underlying technology and what that enables as new use cases. So in the world of cryptocurrency or blockchain, people are talking about everything from it's going to power your internet-connected toaster in some sort of techno-utopian future on through to it's just a speculative asset and who knows if it's going to be worth anything. Um, in reality, if you look at what a blockchain is, it's a decentralized database, which means it's a crappy database. It actually works much less well than some things that's centralized, but it has a lot of features that open up new use cases. One of them is the fact that it's trustless. It means that it's resistant from government seizure or seizure by thugs or others if you have an asset that's on the blockchain because nobody, no single entity controls it. Uh, a second characteristic is it's an open ledger, so you can see all the transactions that are happening, which means you can audit it. So for example, if you wanted to put real estate titles on it in a country where there um, is concern about uh, corruption around land use, um, that may be an example of how you can take advantage of that. Third, it's private. So there are certain types of technologies that enable very strong cryptographic privacy, and there's all sorts of implications of that in terms <coughs> of use cases. And then lastly, it's programmatic. It's run by machines, which means that if you ever want to scale machine transactions, um, then it's the perfect platform to do that. There was a, a great quote in a session yesterday from Elizabeth Stark from Lightning Labs where she said, 100% of the machines today are unbanked. And so cryptocurrencies or the blockchain allows you to have very fast algorithmic interactions on top of a, of a computer system algorithmically. So there's all sorts of different use cases that open up when, when you take advantage of those things. If you're not taking advantage of one of those four characteristics though, it's actually a very bad solution. And so when I hear people talking about, you know, the next Uber is going to be on the blockchain, the question is why? It should just be on a centralized database. There's no reason to use the blockchain. So uh, if I want to raise a bunch of money, though, shouldn't I just put, you know, blockchain in my company title? I oh, mean, yeah, no, it's a great fundraising mechanism, so. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I, I, you're not advising that? I mean, I feel like. Yeah, it's actually interesting. Um, there was a company that actually changed its name to blockchain and it sort of, uh, in the public markets, and it, it, I think it doubled or something simply because of the name during the, the last hype cycle. You know, fundamentally, an example of a great um, series of use cases is around financial transactions. There, you don't want a central authority necessarily in the way. You want it to be resistant to government or other seizure, especially if you're living in a, in a bad regime or a country. Um, and the fact <coughs> that you can deal with it programmatically has all sorts of advantages. If you think about it, for example, Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies are the only way that you can cross a border with a billion dollars literally in your head, right? So it's a, a new store of value that you can use to cross borders without any sort of intervention. And that's really powerful if you think of sort of the history of mankind and all the instances in which uh, populations have had to flee a bad regime. Okay, and I don't want to get too technical on this panel. Let me just ask you one question. You know, you don't just say car. You know, there's like lots of different kinds of cars. And you know, we throw this word around blockchain. You know, wh where, how do we think about sort of different permutations of blockchain, or how do you help us to sort of make a distinction in that? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think fundamentally, um, there's basically two types of characterization. There's public versus private. So is it something that's running across open computer systems, or is it something that's running inside enterprises or in other private environments? And then the second is, what are the uh, types of additional things that are built on top of it? So for example, Ethereum is a blockchain that allows you to effectively run programs on top of it. 
um, or to create uh, securities. You know, there's these famous ERC-20 tokens, which are a great fundraising mechanism on Ethereum. Aren't they famous? They're so famous, these ERC-20 tokens. Yeah, they're fantastic tokens. <laughs> <laughs> they're my top five favorites. Okay. And so, <laughs> um, and so uh, you know, so that there's things that allow for more complex um, either securitization or programming languages to effectively be run on top of this decentralized database, uh, which is a blockchain. Um, there's privacy-centric blockchains like a Zcash or Monero, where really what they're focusing on is um, the, the cryptographic might of, of uh, the ability to secure assets that nobody can actually see that you're transacting in. So there's a variety of different types, but when all is said and done, I kind of view those as three of the, the biggies. Okay. Um, and I promise you we are not going in this order because that's how they sat us. This is really the order that I wanted to go in. Uh, Sandra Rowe, you are, uh, uh, in addition to running a couple of companies, you are head of the Global Blockchain Business Council. You, as far as I can tell, spend your entire life on an airplane. And uh, you see all of these jurisdictions. You were telling me last night you have so much incoming in terms of requests to be part of the council and to be part of what, you're, what you've created. Can you give us kind of a landscape view? Maybe start with the business side um, and then talk a little bit, and we'll probably get back to it in round two, but give us a sense of kind of where the hot countries are and who's doing the most. Right. So GBBC, as a Swiss nonprofit, is focused on helping educate the governments, regulators, and executives around the world who are trying to get their heads around this blockchain thing. And what we do is we go to various countries around the world, uh, some very large and also some very small. And what we're seeing a couple trends, and I'm just going to highlight a couple here and then we can dive deeper yeah. if you would like later. Um, so what we're seeing is actually a conversational change. I've been in the space for about seven years, and I have to say, as a former banker, it started with the financial services, and it's evolved. And therefore, financial services, you're going to see more use cases and live things happening uh, than you are in, for example, aviation. We're just beginning to talk to aviation, um, industry, uh, fashion houses, and mainly it's around track and trace. So you're seeing some evolution, and I see in many ways a number of S-curves that are forming over the last seven years within the blockchain space alone. And what do you mean and by S-curve? So meaning early adopters, then going up the curve, and then maturing. And what we're seeing is that it's not one S-curve, it's actually a series of them. And different industries are starting their path uh, and are maturing at different rates. And so what we're going to see, I think, is a proliferation across industry sectors, but a lot of it has to have one thematic, and this is what I'm gonna leave you with for now, is that it is around trust. Do you need to increase trust in a network or a system? And if you do, and you need to shine that light and transparency, then actually blockchain makes a lot of sense. Furthermore, there are two worlds. There's the developed world that already has a lot of infrastructure and existing institutions, which might be really sound and great. Then why do you need a blockchain? You probably don't. But in a world where there may be little infrastructure or no infrastructure at all, there is the leapfrog opportunity, which a lot of people in the developing world, and by the way, the vast majority of our inbound are not the big guys. It's actually small islands, small countries from all over who are wanting to know more about this and trying to figure out, can we change laws? Can we come up with a niche inside of this technology where we can be best in class and get a piece of this pie? And frankly, from a democratization standpoint, we are all for that. Um, so we do our best to get to as many of these countries as possible. Okay, um, what infrastructure are you talking about that you know, is either good or missing? So uh, we are talking in some developing nations about identity. People do not have record of who they are and can't prove who they are, nor their assets. Uh, there are trillions of dollars locked up in dormant assets because they, you don't have land title. You don't have uh, title around the car, the machinery, the animals you own. There is no way to prove because there's just no record of this in a formal setting. So you might argue, well, just put together an Excel spreadsheet. Why do you need a, just a database? Why do you need um, blockchain? Well, here's the thing what Elad was referring to, if you could rebuild from scratch anyway, why wouldn't you use the latest technology We could potentially also overlap or embed payments, embed auditing function, and embed record keeping in a way that is an easy way to share information. The future world is data as value. So if you believe in a world where data is value and it moves around in a digital world, it does unlock many, many use cases across industries. 
and we're just beginning to see that. Okay, so let's dive into a bunch of these use cases. And Bill, I'm going to start with you just to show the, just to show the audience that I don't have to go in um, absolute order here. Um, you have uh, probably about 17,000 use cases that you could talk to us about, but why don't you, why don't you pick sort of a couple and, and you know, give us some real, uh, don't stay too high level, give us some real insight into why you think these are. Sure, so, so uh, uh, a little bit of background. It's a, it's the, the, uh, I, I started as a computer chip designer, which was like organizing electrons, and then I built an ISP in 1994, which is kind of organizing uh, uh, bits, you know, so from physical electrons to bits, and now we're in the world of organizing assets. And so the marketplace, uh, every marketplace can be made more efficient using blockchain as a backbone, like TCP IP is for web pages and HTTP. And so if you, if you think about some applications, um, actually, I want to counter something that Elad said about the next Uber won't be on blockchain. Because uh, when I look at Uber, of course, Uber is very successful as a revenue company. But to me, it looks like, if you guys remember Prodigy or CompuServe, it looks like Prodigy with cars on the end of it. You know, so I think in, over time, the public blockchain, like the internet, will, will drive economies of scale where the cost structure is so low, it'll be marginally easier for the next developer to put something on it. You know, something like an Airbnb, that's like lodging on the end of a blockchain. You know, it's, it's, there, there's so many things. So, so I'm funding a bunch of marketplace things. So I've got a project in Australia, which is basically uh, uh, electrical grid on the blockchain, which is Power Ledger. I'm funding kind of playtime with digital cats. I'm a backer of CryptoKitties. Yeah, he almost uh, broke Ethereum, <laughs> I just want to say. It, it's, it's been the number one application on the Ethereum blockchain. I've got a couple projects going uh, out of New York with a company called Fluidity, where we're putting buildings on the blockchain. So the, that company basically created something called Fluidity Factora. A group from Goldman Sachs that did structured finance took a, uh, uh, their practice, acquired a $35 million building, um, tokenized its ownership so that's liquid on a marketplace, and now there's a billion dollars of backlog of other buildings and aircraft leases and all kinds of stuff coming at us. Uh, there's implications for how you film entertainment, uh, how, you, how you handle uh, film finance, entertainment finance, instead of, uh, you know, paper LLP, LLC agreements, you can tokenize that. So, um, yeah, so I've got projects in all those areas. Yeah, and I should have, I'm very sorry, I should have said that, you know, Actai is a, is a uh, venture capital firm and Bill's had a lot of success taking various companies public. So if he's putting his money in it, it's probably going to work. <laughs> It's all um, money, yes. <laughs> I, write, I wrote my own checks, it's not LPs. Yeah, right, yeah, he writes his own checks. Um, let me, you've just now thrown out a new word, though, which is this token word. And so can you, you know, step back, and I really, I don't want anybody in this audience to leave saying, okay, I only learn, I kind of get it now. I want everybody to leave this room thinking, like, I get it about this blockchain thing. I can go to a cocktail party, and I can be like, hey, you want to hear about that blockchain thing? I know what that is. Like, we need to be able to, like... Well, think of a token as an intelligent coin. You know, so if you think about uh, a world where everything's digital and things are connected to a transport layer, like, you know, like your email is to a system where you can kind of pop it in and it goes where it's supposed to go, and there's a tracking mechanism that knows where it is, and then there's layers of things where you can build things on top of it. So like you can put an auto forwarder on it so that if the email comes to me, it automatically gets distributed to other people. Those are functions, you know, if there's, there's a term, if this, then that. You know, so you can basically build logic trees on top of assets with pieces of software that make the whole system automated and efficient and low friction. So think of it as, uh, you know, like, what. There, there are all kinds of like games, like you know, guys have heard of Farmville, right? Farmville, it's, uh, it's not really a predecessor to blockchain, but some of the behavior is similar, right? You take your US dollars, you put them into Farmville, you get Farmville cash, you get a plant, and you can use your Farmville cash to buy a digital tractor or digital fertilizer to grow your plant a little faster. Okay, so- Okay, but Farmville is stupid. I mean, you know, but- $3 billion of okay. revenue. Okay, right. So, yes, it is, yeah, but you know, it's entertainment. Yeah, so, so you think of that token, if it were a currency, you could automate payments. You could have contracts where um, if this happens, then that happens, and the payment systems are all automated, and they, they don't involve people. So you can have an array of machinery. You know, so think of a world where uh, there's you know, IoT, uh, Internet of Things, um, things like in cars and in tollways and things like that, where as you're driving, there's charging and payments. 
that are flowing through the system, like, you know, we're, we're all in the matrix now. You know, it's kind of like that. It's all, we're all connected and everything just flows. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you in the next time I get to you to talk us through maybe the power ledger example or the building example in, a, in, in detail. But um, Stefan, why don't um, I turn to you next? And you uh, are the CEO of Bitfury Surround. Before you talk about your solution, can you talk about what a cluster, you know what, the music business is uh, in general and why you think it's, there's a, just how does it work now and why do you think it's kind of ripe for disruption without sort of first talking about your solution? Okay, okay. So, um, yeah, well, I've been in the music and entertainment industry working for Vivendi and digital business development for like almost 20 years. So um, I've experienced a lot of ups and downs, but generally, you know, for the last couple of years, the pretty much deceiving growth, which is absolutely, you know, um, uh, uh, minimal compared to the growth that the actual data solutions provide uh, to the market. So the market is growing by approximately 8 to 9 percent. It has a, c a compound annual growth rate of 8 to 9 percent, but it's still like 30 percent below the numbers of 1999 when everything was still, you know, CD driven and, and vinyl driven. So you see that there is a, there is a disproportion of growth uh, in and outside of the industry. Um, paired also with an increase in user-generated content coming into the market. So you have a, a huge growth of um, content as it's being produced by individuals in a, in a very um, a very easy way and non-cost, uh, uh, not, non -very, not very costly uh, due to the, um, to, to the progress in the devices and, and the capabilities of people being like becoming, everybody can become a musician, so to speak. Now, what we see is that there is a constant decline in the average asset value uh, over time, and that is, um, that is absolutely unlogical in a, in a growing environment. And what do you mean by asset value? Over that time? means that the individual uh, output per song per year uh, and on a global basis is uh, declining, whereas at the, on the other hand, the, the, the usage of music on a global basis is increasing like crazy. Okay, so, so let me see if I can, trans if I can make, make sure I understand this. Songs are getting, they're being played more, yes. but the artist is not making as much money. Making less money, making less exactly. Money. The average artist makes a lot less money, even though his songs or her songs are being played uh, is, much more. And more? the usage has multipli multiplied because in the old days you only had like two or three usage scenarios. Now you have 200, like going into gaming, going into social media platforms and everything. But it's super hard because there's no access from the creator side to the data that is actually driving the commercial uh, value of, this, of, of the assets. So that is, has a lot to do with um, the infrastructure that is uh, very old. So we are talking about Amish kind of level infrastructure play <laughs> uh, with, um, you know, very, very old fashioned and nothing against the Amish, <laughs> uh, but it's really like uh, super, super old school. Um, nothing, no, no, you know, all the systems are not talking to each other. Everybody is trying to keep very, uh, every process very uh, opaque because it's, uh, it's about a protection of legacy in the system. Uh, very, um, a very fragmented market, um, you know, based on individual power plays. It's a collaborative uh, product, but it's actually more like a, uh, it's more like a, 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 a very centralized individual uh, situation of how to handle it. That's why everybody is so mad about the labels and at the same time collecting societies like you now have the M Music Modernization Act in the US, Article 13 in Europe, are calling for governments to pr support uh, the individual artists. And this is why I, th I think uh, for us, this is a perfect example of where blockchain technology and as um, uh, as uh, Elad and Sandra were describing it, um, is a m perfect match and perfect fit. And we see that the market can be probably uh, go five to ten times up, meaning that you know the creative industry is at least putting, I would say, uh, 50 to, to, to 80 billion dollars a year uh, uh, on the side due to the fact that the, the old competitive system is no longer working. Okay, so you, you see this, you've been in the music business for a very long time. Yes. And you see all this going on and it, it seems that you can't, that artists are not able to track, you know, when their song is being played in a YouTube video and it says, yes, they're not getting their royalties and plus they have to believe people when they say, oh, you know, Spotify says, oh, your song yes. was played 10 times. So, you know, okay, I'll just believe you, I guess. So you were sitting around one day drinking a gin and tonic, I guess, <laughs> and you were like, hmm, hmm. And 
what, what is it that made you go, hmm, things that make you go, hmm, um, and what, what is your solution? Okay, so the, the, the reason why I strongly believe in this is because it has, you know, the, the, the technology itself has everything that it takes in order to, uh, uh, in order to succeed. Uh, you have all the scammers, all the bad examples in the beginning, that's always the case. You have, uh, you know, um, a, a lot of uh, efficiency being driven by this uh, Full decentralization and 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 uh, you know by the features of the of the of that paired with AI, for example. So I could smell it. To be honest, I was not uh, smarter than most of or any of you. I was just happy to run into uh, Valery Vavilov and Bill and and the guys who really explained to me in detail, but I could smell that there was something uh, that could come out of this, and this is when we decided to create like a global infrastructure for the entertainment industry and um, based really on the, the way how copyrights are managed. So what we are doing is we're creating a global copyright registry. Believe it or not, as of today, you cannot even register copyrights other than going to, you know, like physical like contracts and 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 country yes, by country. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's really uh, it's really nightmare. You can you can exploit and you can make money in one second on the YouTube side, but it takes you nine months to get your act together with your fellow friends on how who's making money on what. Because it's a collaborative product. You have a designer, you have an artist, you have a, a writer, you know. You, there is no infrastructure in place that would protect these people for whatever they do. But on the same, at the same time, the, the market can take, can take the assets. And then there is another, which is very important, the intelligent database uh, Bill was just talking about, like um, a database that the, 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 the industry is, c is currently completely blind. I mean, unlike the gaming industry where you can iterate and you see what works and what doesn't work, you can put up like a Fortnite in three to four years because you can use all this efficiency coming out of the data access. Nobody has access to data. That's why, you know, looking into Spotify, there is one uh, company that has centralized data on all the usage around the world, <laughs> and everybody that is feeding into it is completely blind. Right. So you are missing so much right. on this. And then we have another thing, which is also very important, the, authentic the authentication. So you have like 10,000 new songs coming up per day, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of podcasts, tickets being printed, T-shirts being done, you know, nobody has uh, control. This is really in line with the licensing uh, agreements that have, been, that have been done. And then the, w the way that this actually remunerated is so old school that it will take six to eight months for anybody to get the money. Okay. So things like this. Okay. And then the open app environment, finally, which I think is going to be strong, is that let anybody do whatever they want and get access to the content. Today, that's not possible because okay. you have somebody sitting in a label, rented actually the content because the content belongs to the artist and saying, okay, I have to check how, what is my result today? So how can I make my EBIT uh, <laughs> that I need in order? So it's not driven, it's driven yeah. by protection. So okay. that's basically okay. why I believe it's powerful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Uh, Tamika, you run um, for New America Foundation sort of everything blockchain. And New America is a very interesting place because you've got, uh, it's, it's a think tank, but it's also a do tank um, uh, in many ways. And so can you, and you work with governments around the world, can you talk to us a little bit about what is the public policy um, um, opportunity uh, using blockchain and kind of where, where are you working and give us some, some idea about that. It's a great question. The core of our engagement with government is trust, and Sandra raised this a little bit earlier. Every interaction that we have with institutions, with authorities, is dependent on trust. And unfortunately, we're at a moment in the world right now where depending on which set of numbers you use, if you take Edelman, about four in five people around the world don't trust the systems uh, in the country where they live. That's a massive problem. And there are a whole host of reasons for that, but one of the most critical contributing factors is that government as a sector has been arguably the slowest of all sectors to adopt digital transformation. And we have institutions that were designed in the 19th century using technology from the 20th century to try and solve problems of the 21st century, and it ain't working that great. The opportunity with blockchain is multifold, and we're seeing this play out in a couple of different ways. But because trust is hardwired into the infrastructure of these platforms, we have an opportunity to do clean sheet design and create new solutions that can power the public sector in the 21st century 
far more efficiently, far more securely, far more transparently than anything that would have been possible previously. I got into blockchain when I was working at the State Department, and I had probably, at that point, the best job in Washington. I led a team that operated like a venture fund working directly for the Secretary of State. And I went and sat down with the president of Estonia, uh, the country that has the world's most advanced e-governance system, and asked him if we were to try to build this in other places around the world, what would it look like? What, how should we go about it? And he said, if we were to start today, we would build on blockchain. Hmm. And the opportunity in my mind, and we're doing this now in partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation and a range of other actors around the world, is to build almost a Linux style operating system for government that'll be an 80% solution grounded in the security, efficiency, and accountability provided by blockchain, optimized for many different applications, and then different governments will be able to come in and customize the last 20% of that solution to their specific needs. But if we do this, we have the potential to, in, in an institutional sense, leap over the copper wires, which are still being built in uh, governments in the US and, and many places around the world, and really go to something that's fit for purpose in the 20th, 21st century to meet the needs of citizens. Okay, so what would be an example? So we are, I'll, I'll give you two. We just did a project with the state of West Virginia where the Secretary of State came to us. He said, we have a big problem. I used to be in the military and I, when I was stationed on a hillside in Afghanistan, I could not cast my vote. There was no way for me to get my ballot securely back to the county clerk who needed to record that ballot. Uh, and so we worked with uh, the Secretary of State and a technical partner and a range of county clerks all over West Virginia to build out a blockchain-based voting platform. And in this last election, if you were a West Virginia voter outside of the country, you cast your vote on blockchain from your mobile phone. Uh, and it was secure, it was accountable, it was transparent, it worked beautifully. Transparent? Uh, it was. Um, now, there was a secret ballot, so there's no way to, okay. to link it back, uh, your vote back to the voter. Okay. Uh, but there was far, far more uh, transparency than the systems that we were relying on previously, uh, which ranged from faxing back a paper ballot to emailing back a ballot. It was not a pretty picture. Mm -hmm. Second example I'll mention is a project that we just started with New York City, where we're building out a digital data wallet for citizens in New York City. If you're a single mom, Maria, and you're trying to gain access to healthcare benefits uh, or SNAP nutritional benefits, in about 75% uh, of the cases, you're gonna be rejected because you don't have the right documentation. And this doesn't just apply to the, the poor single mom. <coughs> My wife, who has a lot of education, the only time I think I ever saw her cry in our early marriage was on her seventh trip to the DMV to try to change her name in Washington, D.C. Uh, to our new married name. So this is something that affects everyone. If we take these documents, put them into a secure digital wallet that is rooted in blockchain technology, built on open source standards, it's gonna be a lot more secure for individuals. They're gonna have ownership of their data, but it's also gonna make it a lot easier to interact with public institutions, eliminate fraud, and solve a lot of problems for a lot of people. Okay, but this poor woman on welfare, single woman on welfare, she's single, poor woman on welfare, with a blockchain application? I mean... If you have a phone, you can have a blockchain. Uh, this is, uh, and, and I have a good friend who says, we will know we have won with blockchain when we can stop talking about blockchain. Mm -hmm. This is a technology that is largely gonna run in the background and it's gonna make things a lot better, uh, but it's not something that people are necessarily going to uh, need to study at an intricate level and be able to quote hash rates and, and you know, petahashes and things of that sort in order to make sense of. Uh, if we're doing it right, it's pretty invisible uh, to the consumer, to the single mom, the citizen on the other side. Okay, I'm going to open this up to sort of anybody, but maybe to Sandra and to Micah primarily. It does strike me that the, if you're talking about trust, you know, the bedrock of this value proposition is trust, that the governments that you need to worry about are not the governments that are going to want to play ball on this. And the governments that are interested in this kind of transparency are probably not the governments that you need to worry about in the first place. I'm, I'm happy to yeah, go, jump go in on it. that. I, I will say that's partly true, but we need to worry about the fact that governments that claim to care about accountability, claim to care about transparency, 
using their existing systems aren't able to deliver that for their citizens. And that is a global failure. There are only a handful of exceptions anywhere on the planet where governments are actually realizing the potential of the tools that they have available. And so we need to think about this at a systems level for all governments, but we also need to be very conscious of the potential for misuse of the technology. Because like any technology, you, know, you can use nuclear power to light up a city or destroy it. You can use steel to build hospitals or make machetes. This is pretty neutral stuff. It's, it's dependent on how we harness it, and we're not neutral. Uh, and so it's up to us to shape the values and the use cases in ways that are going to provide broad benefits for a lot of people. Yeah, and, and if I may add on, build on what Tamika just said, um, some of the conversations that we're having. So, for example, we've been sitting um, with the Australian government and um, having the conversation around the fact that they've got tons of data. There's data everywhere. Um, they have laws, and they've actually identified over 500, which prevent them from one agency talking to another agency and sharing that information. Wow. So, one, they have have to actually amend a, a whole litany of laws to be able to do that. That's step one. At least they've identified there's over 500. And step number two is they know they can deliver better <coughs> services to their citizens by um, uh, offering programmable money, and I'll talk about that in a second, and uh, digital identity, all sorts of various uh, you know, ease of access or removing of frictions. Um, DMV would be another equivalent um, uh, situation. But here's the thing. It is a double-edged sword. So if the government were to program money, which they're all talking about, um, that do sounds you, good to me. I mean, uh, are you going to sell that application? Hold to on. You? <laughs> um, then they could program the money to go out. That's taxpayer money. That can only be used for food, rent, um, et cetera, especially if you're on benefits. Mm -hmm. And that might sound really great. Mm -hmm. Or for foreign aid, we could program that money to only go towards certain things within the foreign aid bucket, right? And that could actually help citizens feel a bit better about all this money going out the door, because one of the things the government said to us was that the perception of the citizen is always that more money is going to foreign aid than actual foreign aid that's actually relative to GDP. Um, it's probably less than 1% in most cases. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's closing that gap on per trust and perception. But here's the issue. Do you really want, um, as a citizen, I don't care where you sit in the socioeconomic spectrum, governments knowing that you spent money on Cheetos or Doritos or alcohol or cigarettes or whatever, um, because they now have access to records of every transaction that you do. Um, you could argue, well, today I spend money with my credit card. Yes, but all that information is not concentrated in one place under one roof called the government. Uh, it would actually have to be coupled together. So to me, there is a fine line and a question that we need to all ask ourselves. Where is that line around data privacy, data access, and who actually owns it, controls it, and what does that mean for society? And uh, it's coming, and we need to really think about how we're going to approach this as a society. You look like you're right. right. Do you want to say something, Nalan? Oh, uh, no, I mean, I, I was just going to uh, comment a little bit on uh, Tamika's uh, pro previous comment, which is I think there are certain circumstances where the blockchain is absolutely needed, and then there's lots of circumstances where I think you just need better digital infrastructure. So, you know, if anybody who's worked at a company that's been around for 30, 40 years and has antiquated computer systems, it's basically impossible to do anything with the data that's available, with the infrastructure that's available, with the tooling that's available. Uh, companies like UiPath on the RPA side are trying to automate things simply because there's no APIs on top of some of these software uh, products. So in other words, they're very hard to manipulate. You know, our government has been around for what's 200... Been, what's been around? Our, our government oh. has been around for 200 plus years. Obviously, everything they do is very paper-based, it's antiquated, it's not uh, obviously the most efficiently run organization. And the older an organization, the more corrupt there's going to be. And so you can look at, at countries like Estonia, where they've done enormous things in terms of identity, in terms of banking, in terms of multiple government services. You can get your, um, you, you can effectively go to the DMV online and, and uh, get a new record or get a new driver's license really easily. And so in that case, they weren't using blockchain for anything. It was just they used modern um, internet and computer technologies to do it. And so for me, again, it comes back to the question is, when do you truly need a blockchain? And there's tons of examples where you do. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a huge crypto bull. Yeah. Um, but I think there's, there's lots of examples where you're like, well, maybe you just need the old school technology that exists. You just need to apply it effectively. And to some extent, I think one of the interesting things about the rise of the blockchain is that it's a great excuse 
for companies or governments that can't make leeway with the traditional systems to say, hey, there's this new thing over here, and therefore let's build on that, and it allows you to end run the internal teams that would normally block it. Right. And so to me, it's this really interesting, almost social phenomena of how can you get around right. the crappy legacy systems and use a blockchain as a marketing tool to do something new that actually everybody wants. So can I just give one example to that? The Caribbean have bandied together and have created the Barbados digital dollar. Central Bank has passed that. And that is because they are left out of the SWIFT <coughs> system and often cut off from US dollars. So what is the next best alternative if the current system doesn't work for you? Get together with your local neighbors and come up with an alternative solution. That's an excellent point. Elad, can you s s talk about identity? What does this mean, this new idea of identity? What, what's the kind of the nirvana of identity? Yeah, it, it's, uh, I think there's lots of different aspects to it, and some of them are a little bit countervailing because in one sense, you want to be able to have various aspects of data about yourself in a single place that you can use in order to transact uh, in order to um, uh, build, in some sense, uh, global or societal credibility. And at the same time, you want to be able to keep tight control over that information and make that data very private. And the, que the question is, how can you build a permissioning system where your data is effectively cryptographically secured so nobody can access it without your permission, and you can give differential permission to different parties so that they can access different aspects of your data at will? I see. And that could be your medical record, that could be financial transactions, that could be a variety of things. So when the policeman pulls you over, you can um, give him proof that you can drive, but you don't have to give your, your address, exactly. for example. Okay, all right. Um, Bill, how, how are you going to solve the power distribution? Yeah, so, so you know, everybody here has electricity, I take it. You know? And so, so electricity seems complicated to people. It's actually a lot like water. So you know, all your houses, you basically have a pipe and there's pressure in there and you turn on your faucet, it comes out. Electricity is exactly the same way. You've got these wires that you're putting electrons in and putting them up at high voltage and you turn on the faucet, it comes out. So if you think about the way things work here in California, I, I was running a little Bitcoin mining operation in my house for a while. Okay, so the, the range of you know, what I paid PG&E was 10 to 26 cents a kilowatt hour depending on time of day. Okay, so imagine the three of us, we're all next door neighbors and those guys have solar and they're producing, right? As they produce electricity and jam it into the grid, if they overproduce their need, then PG&E might buy that for two or three cents a kilowatt hour, right? But we're on the same thing. Why can't that just get redirected to me and instead of him making two or three cents, if I'm paying 26, he makes 25 cents. We're all on the same grid. It's like kind of stupid that you can't do that, right? So there's a company that I backed in Australia called Power Ledger. And they basically have uh, just a little piece of software that records everything on, the smart, on all of our smart meters and writes it to one system, a blockchain-based system, so everybody's kind of aware of everybody else. And if I just want to do a deal, there's a smart contract. And then I'm buying electricity at maybe five cents a kilowatt hour, not 26. You, know, so you there, say, if, 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 you will, if you have this price, I will buy it. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can set a market price, mm -hmm. and it has a lot of implications. Think about, uh, so the world over time has been going you know, from centralized to decentralized in a lot of things. You think about telephone companies. When, uh, when there, there used to be monopoly, tel you know, telcos here, and things got digitized, any kid could buy a Cisco router and stick it in their garage, connect it, and then resell those bits. And they were a phone company. 10,000 came up like in a year, right? Same thing I think is gonna happen in power. There ha has to be like a regulatory release. But if you think about what happened when that happened, you had this gigantic distributed resilient network that you couldn't kill. There was no central point of failure. Think about the implications for power in a place like the BVI or where that hurricane blew through, Puerto Rico. You have a power plant, the hurricane goes through, millions of people have no power for a year. What if you had 10,000 small producers that were economically incentivized? It'd be like the internet, like 30% of it could be gone and you still have power, right? So I think there, there are great things that can be accomplished when you marry economic incentive and distributed technology with practical applications like that that are really quite transformative. But then who's gonna, somebody has to maintain the grid though. You're sort of taking, you're taking- Well, yeah, you need the transmission solution. lines, just like internet, you know, None of you that, if you ran an ISP, none of you actually built the wires, it was there. 
you know, but, one, but you could go wireless on that over time, but in the beginning you had, had to hook up for phone wires. So you need the transmission infrastructure, and that should be something of national interest like highways are. But then the applications that run on it, they can be software and they can be distributed, and it, it just is better for this country and world. And, you know, and that little power ledger, so the, the pace of change now is amazing. You know, the other waves we had, silicon and internet, those move fast. Power Ledger, I think we, we kind of put that together about two years ago, um, a few people. They are now in trials in Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, Korea, Japan, the USA. Uh, they're a provider, for example, to Northwestern University. So think about, you know, Northwestern has several campuses, hundreds of buildings, some are in the shade, some are in the sun. Why should they be paying the same rate for all those buildings when they're producing in the ones that are in the sun and they can't offset it, but now they can. You know, so I think there's uh, applications behind the, f the, you know, kind of the firewall as well, but there's lots, there's so many things that I think, you know, a little crypto crash made people think, oh, this was just like a hype and fake and all that, but there are a lot of real things getting built right now. Right. Uh, Tamika, when you work with government, say in the land registries, for example, and I'm sure you have other examples, there's this, and, and Sandra, I think you have an example in Africa too, how, how do you deal with the garbage in, garbage out? problem. I mean, you know, when you get it on the database and then you've still got to trust sort of the ultimate origin of the information, don't you? It's a very important point. We collaborated with Bitfury on building the first blockchain-based land registry in the Republic of Georgia. Uh, and in that instance, you had a, a really important need, which was, you know, if, if Bill had a beautiful piece of property uh, by the water in Georgia and I wanted it and my cousin worked for the land registry, Historically, all I had to do was go talk to my cousin. My cousin would sign that property over to me. And because the registry controlled the record, there was almost nothing he could do about it. They could wipe out any evidence that it had been his to begin with, and that property would be mine. So in an environment like that, there is a crucial need to restore trust to the system, and blockchain is really good at doing that for reasons that uh, Alad alluded to earlier. You can design infrastructure that is beyond the reach of even a corrupt official uh, to modify the data or alter the data without leaving a record. Uh, and so in, in the case of Georgia, the reason we went there first is because the World Bank had invested an enormous amount of time and energy to get their records right. And, and their records, even before we started, were regarded as the third best in the world. Uh, but my friend Sheila Warren at, at the WEF says that blockchain creates a challenge where it's not just garbage in, garbage out, but garbage in, garbage forever. And we need to be looking at the creation of new industries that are going to clean data and launch data onto blockchains to ensure that it's right going forward. It also creates a really intriguing insurance opportunity. Right now, every single time we have a property transaction in the United States, we're paying a lot in title insurance. It's kind of insane that we do this, but we do this every single time a property changes hands. There's a, a, a real uh, opportunity with blockchain to do that once and then oh, be yeah. done with it. Right. And those are the types of changes that we should be thinking about as we shift over. I'm sure there's some systems. insurance people in this audience, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I don't know when you should be worried, but you should start getting worried. You know, and so you think about the way insurance works, you know. So there's a whole other opportunity, and and Sandra, Sandra will understand this really well because it's marketplaces, right? Marketplaces bring liquidity. And then when they bring liquidity, they bring volume. And then because their liquid prices can also go up, you know, so reinsurance is one of these things that, you know, if you think about how that works, you know, a, a company might insure against uh, hurricane damage in a country for a couple of billion dollars. And then they chunk that out into like $200 million chunks. And then the buyer, the 200 chunks that out into smaller pieces. Imagine those are like share certificates on a stock market, right? So buy, sell, trade, easy. So that, that's actually possible and happening now too, where those, those chunks are turned into tokens with you know, kind of attributes associated with them that automat they execute automatically because there's you know, resources tied to them. That whole business is gonna get automated and it's not gonna be like the big bang and stock brokerage where you know, commissions went from really high to nothing and you guys had to redefine yourselves in investment banking, but I think something's gonna happen. There's gonna be a 30 year wave, but it, that, your whole industry is gonna get remade. Hmm. Um, okay, um, and I'm going to ask you a regulatory, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I just add one thing to the conversation we've been having? So, blockchain does not get rid of people behaving badly. 
you must always assume in a network there are bad actors and people who are willing to cheat. The difference with putting things on a blockchain is that you can find that fraud and those bad actors faster in most cases. We have, whether it's commodities trading or whether it's insurance or any category you can think of, there are always bad actors. But the problem that often I find when I'm looking into where there are issues is how long does it take for those bad actors to be uh, identified, the magnitude of the problem, and then actually getting them out. And the question is, is can you use blockchain to shine light faster because you have the ability to share that information in a way that is, um, let's just say, more efficient and, and, and uh, more transparent. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that, that's where insurance will also benefit. Because think about how much we all pay for premiums. Part of that is because they have to deal with so much fraud. If we could actually reduce that level of fraud, I would hope the insurance companies would reduce our premiums. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. TBD. <laughs> but um, just on, on Sandra's yeah. point, because I think yeah. it's really critical, in the U.S., 30% of every healthcare dollar that we spend is for administrative overhead. Yeah. If our healthcare systems ran on smart contracts, that number is going to be reduced profoundly. It's not going to go to zero, but it's going to come way, way down. So there is a big opportunity here. That piece is larger than the GDP of most countries in the world. Um, so there's a lot of good to be done here if we can get this right. Yeah. So, Stefan, let me see if I understand this correctly. You're going to take every song that's ever been written, that's ever been being written every day, and you're going to like put it on your database. And every time it's used in a YouTube video or played on the radio in some you know tiny little island country bar on the beach, you're going to know and you're going to pay your audience. Like this seems you know Herculean to say the least. What do you mean? What, what do you mean by that? Um, yeah, unrealistic. Yeah, uh, a little. Audacious, a little. Audacious? Yeah, yeah. I think I think it is, but it's not. Uh, it's 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 very much possible with the uh, with the uh, with the power of this technology we've been discussing about going into every slide as the slightest detail in the last atom that you can see. And also, I think what um, just to um, complement a little bit on what was said before, I think when you look at the power of the fans, I mean, just just imagine you have a database that has to be maintained and it has to be upgraded. Now you have like uh, government supported organizations around the world, 27 collecting societies in Europe alone. Uh, What's a collecting con society? Collecting society is basically collecting information on where a song was played publicly as a performan in, in the performing rights, collecting the money, and then clearing this whole process up to the to the individual um, uh, artist and, and writer and composer. Uh, this whole process is taking a lot of time and it's very inefficient. Now, if you, would, um, if you would run this by, for example, fans or the audience in order to main this database, uh, that is super powerful because millions of people would be super engaged in order to solve problems here where we have unbearable uh, uh, overheads for the moment dealing with the problem, taking, uh, taking away 40, 50 percent of the of the uh, uh, of the value that's been generated. So there are plenty of examples how you can, if you really go to the to the smallest um, uh, piece of the action, there is a user, there is a consumption, there is a there is an artist. Um, if you bring that closer together in a way in a way that Bill was just mentioning from the uh, electricity and, and the energy side, I think this is very very powerful. Okay. Um, um, yeah. And, and Bill, can I ask you to piggyback on that with your fan example? Um, b by which I do not mean this kind of fan, I mean music. Like movies. Music, yeah, music yeah. fans. Yeah. yeah, so I'm working on a project with a guy named Barry Osborne, who, by the way, was the producer of uh, Lord of the Rings, Matrix, Great Gatsby, Big Chill, you know, a bunch of stuff. And so very experienced in movies. And if you think about entertainment finance in general, it's one of these areas w that's very black box and opaque, like the music industry. And, and also there's uh, rights that are now spread into many, many things, you know, for physical licensing and digital licensing. Yeah. So if you can imagine instead of sort of, you know, I don't know how many of you have, have uh, been offered to fund movies, but you get these little <laughs> contracts that are very complicated with all these weird layers of things, you know, they're all very different, you know, but if you could basically codify that in software and have some uh, token. So basically you put your money in and everything's kind of automatic and then the, the, the crowd that funds it. Also, f uh, about 50% of the budget of a major movie goes into advertising. So now if you have, you know, basically crowdsourced funding that is 
spreading the word ahead of time. I know there's that Avengers panel the other day where they talked about the impact of social media on the success of that blockbuster, a billion dollars in the first day. It's because social media and the fans got engaged. So imagine having you know, like a really cool sci-fi film and then the fans that like that stuff are the token holders. They're spreading the word ahead of time. It's taking care of the advertising in advance in a bit. And then as the film gets distributed, and there's all these complexities right now that like, you know, the stacks of paper must be horrendous, but they're automatic, right? So all the, all the, uh, the costs of marketing things are, are injected in there. You can, it's, it's no longer opaque. You can see where they are. And then the payouts to the artists, sometimes these, the, the actors and the artists in the films, they may not get paid for two and a half years <laughs> because they're Real. figuring out yeah. the accounting and then Crazy. they have to sue to true up because it was never quite right. Yep. Right, and there's all this finger pointing about what was it, you know, so. so Alto, too, in many ways, over the years. Yeah, no. yes. Never yeah. final. Never, <laughs> never, it's like that. So, so imagine that all of these things are automatically <laughs> recorded as they go through, and the infrastructure of the studio is now a software program. We really are in the matrix, we're heading yeah. there. <laughs> and then let's add another layer to this, the 360 degree. 360 degree shared economy model. So now your fan base, not only are they in the network and helping you be a distribution, being your distribution, you will pay them in kind in passive income for being that uh, fan base naturally, but they are also marketing for you, so you will pay out to them. In a tokenized world, that is absolutely possible. And imagine what the power of people are if you get um, mass uh, distribution networks. Um, so I think we're just beginning to see models around how people get paid for uh, interacting on social media um, at a level that, um, well, it's nascent. I think there are lots of models being tested out right now. So we'll see which ones win. Okay, let me open it up to the audience if there are any questions and I'll be paying tokens for good questions. And uh, <laughs> um, so there's a mic somewhere. Uh, no, yeah, two people are coming around with mics. So just uh, put your hand up if you've got any, any questions. And if I can remind Hello? you. Hello? Yeah, if I can just remind you that a, a question, it's a short thing with a question mark at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a world where blockchain thrives and cryptocurrency doesn't, assuming you understand that Ethereum is a cryptocurrency and a utility token? Okay, can I, maybe I'll collect one or two, two questions. Yep, uh, we got one in the back over there, and then one over here. So we'll, I'll, we'll do these three first. Um, okay, sir, and then right here, yeah. Thanks. We hear so much um, about um, thefts of, of Bitcoin or loss of Bitcoin or some of these things. And, and what I hear you saying is that it should be easier to resolve. Is it just that the press is making too much of the incidents that occur? What is it that's preventing us from seeing in place now the, the control and the safety and the trust uh, that, you're, that you're suggesting is available through this system? Okay, terrific. And then the last one right here, yeah. Thank you, just building on the last question. Um, yesterday we heard quite a lot about uh, 5G and anxiety around Huawei uh, and sinister foreign governments, etc. Your presumption has been throughout this conversation that um, blockchain is entirely impregnable to that kind of subversion, is it? <laughs> okay, um, anybody that wants, uh, wants them, we've got uh, blockchain versus crypto and then a couple of safety uh, questions. I'm, I'm happy to take the one regarding marketplaces. So I think we need to separate what is going on with Bitcoin, the network, and Bitcoin, the infrastructure that's being built today. So uh, I used to run digitization at CME Group, so I'm quite familiar with market infrastructure. Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Just Chicago Mercantile Exchange Group. Um, and I will tell you that what you're beginning to see play out is crypto or digital assets as an asset class, and therefore what's coming in. You're seeing digital custody solutions, you're seeing insurance on uh, digital assets, you're seeing the back-end post-trade brokers, um, the call-around market, there's an OTC you know, uh, industry burgeoning. And one of the issues that you have at the moment is that you've got these exchange crypto platforms um, most of them are not regulated, and they are vulnerable to um, thefts, the wallet situation, the digital wallet situation, how you hold it, safe keep it. All of these things are getting stronger every year and being built out, and at some point there will be regulatory guardrails that will come into play. 
but let's face it, it's grown up without a lot of that. And now the industry is building infrastructure very similar to traditional assets like gold or um, other tradable assets. I think also if anybody's read The Billion Dollar Whale, you see that happening still in the traditional yeah. financial system. So <laughs> wow. I, I think people will commit fraud whenever there's money available and they can get away with it. And so, I, you know, I don't think it's unique to crypto. I, I think in terms of the blockchain versus crypto thing, um, you know, that, that to me is sort of hard to separate as a dichotomy uh, in part because I do think that the economic drivers of the cryptocurrencies or the tokens themselves are a powerful mechanism that actually empower a lot of the reasons that you'd actually use a blockchain. Um, I think w without them, you just have a bad broken database that's decentralized, but it doesn't necessarily help. There could be some examples in terms of the government use cases, um, but every time that I think about um, cryptocurrencies, you know, I could even imagine a world where the primary use of blockchain is the, the, the store of value and payments and all the true currency side of it versus everything else, although you could imagine any of those scenarios working. I think at a high level, when I started, um, or I helped start the mobile team at Google, and at the time, everybody was on these really crappy early feature phones. And it was very clear that something like WhatsApp would exist because everybody was texting. And you're like, of course, it'll be superior over the internet. But nobody would have imagined Uber. Because at the time, it cost a dollar to do each GPS lookup. And it just wouldn't have been economical to build a service like that. And so I think the cryptocurrency or blockchain world is similar, where it's easy to see the immediate things that are definitely absolutely going to happen just as side effects of the, the technology. You know, the financial services stack being rewoven, as Bell pointed out, securitization of real estate and other assets. There's lots of things that are obvious. I think the really hard thing to extrapolate is the non-obvious stuff. And that may be some of the biggest, most important things, just like Uber and other services are some of our biggest, most important services today on the internet. Yeah, if I could add to that, I think that the key differentiator now is that is a, you can think of a token or a cryptocurrency as the vehicle for the expression of the economic alignment of interests of a community, right? Because you, you have whatever the little group is that believes in a certain type of thing, whether it's a power ledger thing or an Ethereum cats or whatever they are, you know, there's a group of people that believe. And just like, uh, you know, when people got off the boats and, you know, stepped on uh, Plymouth Rock and you drew a line around the forest and said, this is New York, this is Virginia, those communities of interest created their own currency. They all had their own currency. So, so you have interest groups that are now digital and abstracted around the world, not physically constrained, that believe in a certain thing and they create an, eco an economy of their own. And if, the, if their belief is expressed correctly and there's economic alignment, then the token's gonna go up and it draws people in. So uh, they're, I, I, they're tied, I think, and it's a new, it's a totally new thing. Stacy, quickly on the security front. Uh, I was going to make you do that one anyway. <laughs> it is important to acknowledge that the core Bitcoin architecture has never been hacked, so it has proven very secure. At the same time, you should be extremely wary of anyone who tells you that these systems are impregnable or that it is impossible to hack them. They can be hacked. The big caveat to that is they are easily 10 or 100 times as secure as the systems that they are replacing. And for those of us that live in the real world, that are interested in creating real value and solving real problems, that's what we need to keep in mind. It's not that these systems are perfect. They are not perfect, but they are dramatically better than the systems that have led you know, me and I expect many of the people in this room to be able to paper walls of their home with the letters that they've received announcing that their data has been breached. Uh, and that's what we need to move beyond. Okay, lightning round. You have one idea. People should put their money. Um, which end should I start on? Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, we have two uh, minutes or one and a half minutes. Yeah, I mean, one area that I'm really bullish on right now is just um, building out the financial stack to deal with everything that's happening in the cryptocurrency world. And so just like you need custody and ETFs and everything else in the, in the traditional finance world, I think the same thing is being built out uh, in the crypto world. So obviously you have Coinbase as sort of the primary wallets and exchanges. There's things like Anchorage at the custody layer. There's things like Bitwise in terms of uh, ETF or index funds okay. to go meet for brokerage, et cetera. So I think I'm, I'm very bullish on the financial stack. Okay, financial stack. Uh, democratization of financial services and inclusion. Uh, I fundamentally believe this is our opportunity. People with smartphones, 5.4 billion people they're expecting to have smartphones. It's the way to access people who have no access or very little access to financial services. Yeah, I would completely agree with Sandra on this one, to be honest. Okay. So All right. Not I, I, I'd love to see a token that represents conservation of animals and our environment. And I'm working on some stuff in the background there. 
a lot alluded to this, but step zero for solving a lot of these problems, and especially the higher order uh, implementations where you have blockchains talking to blockchains, is digital identity. We get digital identity right, the rest of this is going to fall into place. We get digital identity wrong, hang on to your hats because it's going to be a very bumpy ride. All right, give a round of applause to my fantastic panel. Thank you.